welcome to the first uh, first press conference of the of the session. Uh, first week is coming to a to a close here, and excited to. Um, meet with you guys every week and just give you updates and, and answer questions on anything that might be of concern or what's happened in the state of Oklahoma. Um, I know you guys have all went back and watched my state of the state three or four times and really appreciate that. Um, and all of Oklahoma is watching. Um, but uh, yeah, we talked about a couple of things in the state of the state. You know, obviously we want to continue to make Oklahoma top 10. It was my sixth state of the state. Oklahoma's economy is and our, our, our growth as a state has just really been unbelievable over the last five years and, and really, really proud of, of um, you know, how everything's going. We've got the largest savings account and we've hit lowest unemployment and, and our economy and businesses are really doing well. And, and it's, the, it's the policies that we've been implementing over the last five years, I think, that are contributing to um, a business-friendly environment where companies are looking to move to Oklahoma and we're really starting to grow and get on the map. And, and uh, on a lot of different people's radars. Uh, but <clears throat> business friendly state, something we're always gonna focus on and hopefully the legislature is gonna be working through some bills to, to, to do that. Um, hope centered state, we know that, that family values and hope and a vision of hope and, and some of the social programs and trying to encourage churches and nonprofits uh, to get together and, and focus on helping out neighbors. And we highlighted a couple of those nonprofits that are doing a really good job of, of uh, Maybe our, our young ladies that are aging out of foster care, uh, that, are, that are, you know, really the, the, uh, a community that might be targeted for trafficking and, and different things. And, and we're really trying to promote uh, hope across the state. So Sarah does a great job with that. But that was also a talking point uh, in our state of the state and trying to engage with our be a, be a neighbor program that we've set up. And then the last thing is we're always going to focus on safe communities in Oklahoma. And we've done a really good job on... Uh, on that recently, we, uh, and at the same time, as you guys know, my um, <clears throat> second chances and, and mental health struggles and things that uh, substance abuse and how do we treat those folks differently that get themselves caught up in the justice system and how can we really treat that symptom and that problem. And from the very beginning, in 2019, I said we have to, we've got to, you know, focus our criminal justice system on and lock up people that we're really afraid of. Um, and then not folks that we're just mad at. And so there's a, there's a distinction there that I believe that we can be really fair with our sentences. And we've, we've moved the needle a lot. Since I've been governor, we're up 10 spots. When I took over, we were last place in this category in the country. And as you know, as a business guy, I always look at these metrics and we have different metrics for all the different parts of state government. And, uh, and I'm trying to be top 10 uh, of the best uh, state in the country when I compare ourselves to our peers. Uh, so with that, let me just pause and uh, open it up to questions and concerns and uh, things that you might want to hear about. Yeah, you know, and, and I've had uh, folks from the law enforcement reach out to us and they said, you know, it's, uh, um, it's not, not happening in Oklahoma, then there's no problem. Uh, so the whole point of this bill, civil asset forfeiture, is to tighten it up to say, not to take away the law enforcement's ability to punish criminals. And, and, if, and if, if our OBN or sheriffs or police or any law enforcement, if they, if they catch somebody, you know, running drugs across our state, they have the ability to take that car, seize those drugs. If there's a, if there's a, a bunch of cash in there, we don't want to take that away from law enforcement. Absolutely, we, they, that's a tool in their toolbox that they need. What I'm saying is, uh, if we don't, we want to take away incentives. So, in other words, if somebody has um, something and, and they're suspected of doing doing wrong, and they take their truck, but then they're acquitted of that crime, I think it's very reasonable to give them their truck back. Uh, they shouldn't have to go hire attorneys and go to some kind of civil procedure to get their stuff back. Again, if, they're, if you've got a buttoned up case and they're doing something wrong and you catch them running uh, drugs in an airplane, 100%, take that airplane and, and prosecute them for that crime and you can keep that asset. Uh, but if you're acquitted of something, it's only fair to get your stuff back uh, because we're innocent until proven guilty and I'm not going to make it harder for someone. And, and make it really difficult to go fight government to get their stuff back if they didn't do anything wrong. 
Uh, I think so, yeah, absolutely. And again, uh, like I've said many times before, if I could write the laws, we, we would have it all already done. Uh, my job is to tell Oklahomans what I see, the problems that I see, how can we be top 10, the legislature writes the laws, and, uh, and, then, and then I get a chance to, uh, to sign them. You know, that, that's something that I don't even want to, um, you know, get into. No, we, we don't want to, we want to be a very pro-family state, pro-life state. We want to support the mothers. We want to support children. Uh, so uh, specifics on any bills that are, that are just still being talked about. I think there's 3,000 bills that are filed every year. Uh, I don't even know who did it or what, and you're telling me all this information. But uh, from what you said, that doesn't sound like something I'd be supportive of. Yeah, you know, I mean, <clears throat> we're going to hold vendors accountable in the state of Oklahoma. Um, and I'll get you the exact number of vendors that, that we, we pay on a yearly basis, but thousands and thousands and tens of thousands. And, and uh, you know, the state, I don't know how many lawsuits they have going holding vendors accountable, but uh, we're going to hold every vendor accountable. And, and I, like you, we saw those indictments uh, yesterday, and, and that will all play out in court. Um, but this is a dispute, and, and I think that the state sued them, that vendor, and the, that vendor's counter sued the state. And so it's, uh, it's right now it's a legal argument uh, civilly between the state, and then I think there's, a, uh, there's now a criminal indictment uh, about some, uh, you know, overbilling of the state. And that will all play out in court. Uh, I don't know how that's going to be resolved, but uh, the, overall, the overall rule here is we, have, we spend $22 billion in a state. And there's a lot of vendors that we utilize from mowing the grass to, uh, to you know, uh, cleaning the buildings. And um, in business, you're gonna have disputes sometimes with vendors and we wanna hold everybody accountable. And in auditing, what I learned in school is you follow the money and uh, let's follow the money and let's see if, if there's bad actors and they need to be prosecuted. If there's bad state employees, they need to be prosecuted. Um, and, and I think our attorney general, uh, he's, he's, he's doing that. So I don't <clears throat> wasn't really involved with what tourism uh, was was doing on that, but it's my understanding that tourism, when they thought there was some overbuilding, that they've withheld payments. Um, that's about the extent of the knowledge that I have on that. Uh, I don't think the state is going to be hurt. Uh, then the state sued that vendor, and then that vendor countersued for payments. And so this is like if you're building a house and I hire a builder to build a house for me. And um, there's a dispute. I think, the, I think the builder overcharged me or did this wrong or did that wrong, and I'm suing my builder. And my builder's countersuing me, saying that uh, you still owe me money. And then now you've got the criminal side that's saying that, no, he really did some, he was a bad apple, and he got indicted on some things, and then he'll have his day in court, and you're innocent until proven guilty. And, and this will all play out over the next, uh, uh, the next few months, I think, and, and we'll have more information about of what actually happened on it. But the state will protect its interest against any vendor. And I'll, I'd love to get you all those numbers. We can check with, uh, um, with OMES and see how many vendors the state actually has. I think it'll be surprising uh, how, how much we're actually having to deal with. Governor, if you talked to uh, Governor Abbott recently and, and <clears throat> where are you on the possibility of sending Oklahoma Guard troops down to the border? Yeah, I was actually with, uh, with Governor Abbott on Wednesday night, uh, I was down in, in Houston with, uh, with NAPE, which is an oil and gas industry, and we were on a panel together. Uh, we, we talked about the border, just in a few of the questions we were asked from the, uh, from the moderator. Uh, we didn't specifically, he didn't ask me uh, to send troops. Uh, so we are, he knows our position, he knows the other governor's positions. We have sent a letter to President Biden saying we have to secure our southern border. Uh, we think it's totally in the, in, the, in the sole discretion of the president as an executive to, to secure the borders and, and, and put the right policies in place. Um, and, you know, there hasn't been a lot of talk recently about the federalization of the Texas Guard. And so 
to my knowledge, Abbott has not reached out to our office or any of the other uh, state governors uh, to ask for help right at this point. But we're, we're willing and ready to, uh, to you know, send some troops and help if we need to. Were you surprised that the border security bill in Congress fell apart so quickly after Senator Lankford worked on it? You know, uh, not really because, um, you know, <clears throat> again, uh, the executive is over uh, the border security and it's very clear uh, and I've said it a, a bunch of times, we, I've been to the border several times, I've met with the border patrol officers, and I've asked them this question. I said, do we need to build a wall? And they said, yeah, we, do, we need to build a wall because that, that has choke points and then we know where the drugs are coming through and we, we can, we can, we can uh, enforce it easier. But they said this one policy needs to be changed and it wouldn't cost the American people anything. And it's the simply remain in Mexico policy. And Trump had that in place. And what that means, this, this should not be political. Uh, but if you want to seek asylum to the United States and you want to get a work visa, or you want to come to the U.S. to work, there's a process. There's 28 ports of entry along our southern border. And you need to enter in one of those areas. And you need to apply for a work visa. That's, that's the process. And Trump's policy was you remain in Mexico until you get the legal approval to come. Well, the change was Biden, day one in office, canceled that. And so now, if you come to the U.S., as soon as you set foot on there, you're released into the U.S. and you're given a sheet of paper that says, come back to your court date in a couple years. That's created the migration. Because as we know, when you're in the U.S., then you have the health care benefits. No hospital is going to turn you away. You have the social net that's designed for American citizens. And we're being foolish and we're not even being intellectually honest if we think that we can afford to pay for every, everybody's uh, health benefits. So it just doesn't add up. Uh, and we would, we would like President Biden to go back to that policy. Okay, That's first. And, and, and I don't think that anybody thinks that uh, he doesn't have the authority to do that. Now, I want to say this very clearly. There's an immigration policy that needs to be addressed as well. And I've even been a proponent that the states need to control the H-1B visa processes. Uh, so in other words, doesn't it make sense if the governors or the state departments could, when the business community says, hey, I need 100 uh, work permits, or I need 100 workers here, 1,000 workers here, or we need these engineers from OU that are, uh, we don't want to send, uh, they're, they're, they're in college in the United States. Uh, so we need to have a better H-1B visa, uh, visa process. We think that's something that's separate from the border. And uh, that's being talked about in Washington, D.C. right now as well. And, uh, and I think governors, both sides of the aisle, are talking about the need for that as well. Tax cuts obviously are very important to you right now. Um, given that we also have a lot of needs in deferred maintenance, prisons, roads, et cetera, is it really a wise time for a tax cut? <laughs> Uh, so, <clears throat> big picture, and I hope, I hope a lot of Oklahomans are listening to this, because our U.S. government brought, last year in 2023 brought in $4.4 trillion. Well, how much did they spend last year? They spent $6.1 trillion. So $1.7 trillion over our revenue or your salary, okay? That's unsustainable. We already have a $34 trillion national debt and we are only making interest-only payments on it. Your 30-year fixed mortgage that you have, I know it's depressing sometimes when you see how small amount goes to principal and most of it's interest, but at least you know that when you make your payments for 30 years, you're gonna own your house. Well, our national debt, we're not making principal payments. It's interest-only. That means we never pay it off. But it's worse than that because we're still spending 1.7 trillion. This year, it may be about two and a half trillion over that just gets thrown on top of that national debt. So if there's not a governor on spending, this gets you in a huge world of hurt. Let's come back to the state now. As the businessman governor, when I took over, we had very little money in savings. We'd spent every dime that we have every year, and we were in budget crisis, okay? So you have to have a governor on your spending. That's what I'm trying to, to, to warn Oklahomans about in the future. We can't spend every dime we have, run through our savings, and expect us not to have a problem in the future. So 100% we can afford to do a quarter of a point tax cut. Um, I'll sign any tax cut that hits my desk because it does, one, it does two things. Number one, it continues to make us the most business-friendly state. But number two, it slows the growth of government. 
I'm not saying we don't need to invest in certain things. I'm just saying we have to have a governor on that. Last session, if you remember, I talked about let's do a 76 basis point tax cut or almost three quarters of a point. It would have got us down to a 3.99 handle. Again, why is that important? Nebraska's going to it, Iowa's going to it, Arkansas's going to it, Texas is already at zero. We're gonna find ourselves as an outlier. Uh, we already have higher taxes than Colorado right now. Um, and so <clears throat> we didn't do anything last session. We instead raised base level expenses, so the high water mark now is another 1.14 billion. Like I said in my state of the state, it's not tax cuts that'll get us in trouble, it's the unrestricted growth of government. You're, you're exactly right. You're making my point for me. That's why we spent way too much money last year. And I'll correct you on the managed care. The managed care doesn't add any. The managed care is designed to slow the growth of government in our health care costs. If you look at our trajectory versus other states with managed care, it's a much flatter curve. So that was the reason we're going to managed care. We think that's going to be beneficial for taxpayers long term. But if you go back and look at my state of the state from last year, I said, let's do a 76 basis point tax cut, okay? So that would have been, that would have taken uh, about 300 million out of the budget last year. And then we would have um, done an education package, but instead of done, doing 600 million, we'd only done 300 million, right? It would have slowed the growth because you need to give Oklahomans the tax cut first. It's not sustainable to go over the last five years from a 7.6 appropriation number to 11.8 is where we're at today. That's why I haven't been signing these budgets or I vetoed the budgets. Uh, my job, I, I mean, when I'm done after my eight years, Oklahomans are gonna know that I was for lower taxes and smaller government. There's no doubt about that. Uh, but to answer your question, we would not have grown those things. We would have done a teacher pay raise of $4,000 instead of six or it's a zero sum game. What are we gonna do this year? What if we had flat budgets? What if we had no revenue this year? What would we do? We just, we wouldn't be able to invest. We'd have to make some tough decisions, right? And I just think that's what, that's what the legislature is allowed to do. If there's no governor, my question to American people, why not stop it? Why, why stop at 6.1 trillion? Why not go to 7 trillion? Why not go to 8 trillion? Uh, we, you have to, we have to be fiscally conservative. We have to spend less than we make. And I'm just predicting and telling Oklahomans that if we keep this trajectory, it will be in a, we will be in a problem. The next governor is going to have a problem because revenue doesn't just always go up in a straight line. As a business, you know that. And that's why we have to be modestly grow government. It should be natural. When we have budget surpluses, we modestly grow government, and the rest of it we give back to the taxpayer. Well, I mean, the, if, you, if you ask the question, do you want me to consolidate my college? Everybody's going to be saying, mine's perfect. Go consolidate everybody else's. I said thoughtful. That was your point about yeah. being thoughtful and having yeah. people work together. What did, what yeah. Did so so like, let, let's take two junior colleges, for example. If they're 40 miles apart uh, with technology, do they need to be offering the exact same degrees? So my point is, for the administration, let's be smart. If I've got a junior college that's 40 miles from another junior college, that may have made sense when we set them up in 1907. That doesn't make sense anymore. I shouldn't have the exact same degree programs at a junior college within 40 miles in rural Oklahoma. I think everybody would say, if we drew this up today, that's not the way we would set this system up. What did your staff, have you heard from people after your speech about that though? What did they say oh, about that? Oh, um, Oklahomans are 100% with me. Smaller government, lower taxes, absolutely, Governor, go make the right decisions. But politics gets involved because not my area, not my system, not my area. This building is different than Oklahomans, right? 
This building doesn't want to cut taxes. The lobbyists don't want to cut taxes. That, that, that's, that's not what they want, because then they don't, get, uh, they don't get to come get their programs approved. But I don't represent this building. I didn't come up here to make friends in this building. I have to do things as governor uh, and work with everybody in this building, but my, I've, worked for three, I've worked for four million Oklahomans, and the 3.99 million Oklahomans that I know, they want government out of their lives, and they want to make sure that government's efficient, and government's doing the right thing for the taxpayers. And the other thing to remember, the money is always on the yes side, right? So who has money to hire lobbyists to come up here and run these halls? It's, it's, it's the yes side. It's the people that wanting the programs and wanting the government assistance and wanting this and wanting that. The four million Oklahomans, they don't have the money to come up here to say, no, 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 vote no on that. That's why we have to elect leaders that are here to do the right thing, for the next generation of Oklahomans, not just the next election. And really, the way the money works in politics is if I please all these different folks, then I'm gonna get a lot of money for my next election. That's what you guys need to be writing about. So, uh, so are they going to cut taxes if it's a bigger number? Are they going to cut taxes if it's the same number? What, what are they waiting on? Uh, my point to call in the special session is take all the ambiguity out of it. We know exactly how much money we have to spend. So we, if we do a quarter of a point now, we've got $100 million less to spend. Let's go, let's go set the budget accordingly. Um, again, that's people just spinning you in a circle. The budget is going to, I mean, great question for Oklahomans. If it's a bigger number, does that mean we're going to get a bigger tax cut? Governor, you said you assigned a tax cut that comes to you. Let's say by chance the grocery tax comes to you first. Will you sign that, knowing that if you sign that, the chances of your quarter percent income tax drop all down to the yeah, I would still 100% sign it. From the very beginning, I've said, listen, that's the most regressive tax that we have. Uh, but what's weird is that tax is, worth, is about $400 million out of our, uh, our, out of our revenue. Uh, I would love to get that to my desk. Because then we'd really have to make some hard decisions about our spending. Um, but how can you afford to do a $400 million tax cut and you can't afford to do a $100 million tax cut? Uh, that, that thing doesn't add up to me. But of course, 100%. If, we, if they put a tax cut on my desk of the grocery tax elimination, I, I would absolutely sign that. Thanks, everybody. Thanks. See you all next Friday.